Hey, it's Cameron from Woodlands TV and today we're out here in Argety in Stirling. We're going to meet with Lynn who runs the conservation project of the red kites here. And we're going to hopefully film and photograph some of the red kites that they've managed to bring back from the brink of extinction. Hello, I'm Lynn Bowser and my husband and I run Argety, which is an Upland Hill farm just north of Stirling and home to the Argety Red Kite Project. Well, the kite's arrival on the farm was a bit of a surprise to us, if I'm honest. It was one of those things that happens to you in life that you have never really thought of or dreamed of, actually. The kite release cages, for that is how kites are brought to these release sites, were not actually on our farm. They were on the two farms to the west of us. When they were big enough to be released, they decided to make Argety their home, as did many, many bird watchers. And we had 20 baby birds that first year, so it was a really fragile situation, and something had to be done to manage it. So we got in tow with the RSPB, we're in partnership with them to this day, to set up a viewing facility and to have a ranger on hand every afternoon to talk to the visitors and tell them about the kites and from that has grown all sorts of other conservation work including red squirrels, um, tree planting, you name it. Kites have had a really long history of persecution. They've gone from being the most numerous bird of prey in the, in the UK in medieval times to being added to the English vermin list which meant you got paid for every dead kite you handed in. Um, and through to the rise of the Victorian Gamekeeper, which point they were pretty well extinct in the UK. So they'd gone from being the most numerous bird of prey to a handful of pairs in the remote Welsh valleys. Now, kites are really odd birds. They like living together. So it's a slow outward spread. It's not an explosion into new territories. And so although there are lots of work's been done in Wales to nurse the numbers back up, it really wasn't going to be a quick fix to get kites back over the rest of the UK. So this is why the RSPP decided that they were going to try to plant very small populations in very carefully chosen sites, initially using birds from different parts of Europe, because that means you've not only got numbers, but you've got a better gene pool, which is really important. Uh, from there, it's going to be one of the world's best regarded reintroduction projects, uh, which is amazing. And we've now got a quarter of the world population of red kites in the UK, which in about 25, 30 years, from standing start, is pretty amazing. Well, I think we've been really lucky with kites because they are not a problem in any shape or form. Um, they're largely scavengers, they live largely off carrion that they eat. So we're a livestock farm. We have sheep and we have cattle and we have forestry and the kites just fit into that. They're, they're not going to have an impact on anything that we do. So in a sense it was an easy buy, if you like. Um, as I say, on the back of the kite project come all sorts of things like the red squirrel protection. Um, we've latterly got a, a nature restoration fund grant to plant up all, our, all the sides of our waterways and plant hedgerows so we link up all the habitat. Um, riparian planting is a very hot word at the moment and we have got several thousand trees to plant, just us. So it's a big project but we're really excited about it because it's going to make such a difference. You know, we farmers are pretty busy people and we're also quite resistant to change. <laughs> I'm a farmer's wife and I'm allowed to, to say that. Um, but I think the really important thing is to say that we have to do something. If we all did something, even a tiny something, like, like we've not had a, a complete change of farming policy here. Quite the reverse, actually. Um, but with bits of the farm that are really not very useful for growing food, we have decided to dedicate to the wildlife. And that's not a difficult decision, really. Um, it's not giving up income. It's just reallocating things. And when we plant, we try to plant different sorts of woodlands rather than just acres of conifers. You know, I, I, as I say, I think if we altered something, no matter how small, we could collectively 
make a huge difference. So there's lots of different ways in which you reintroduce um, birds of prey and, and encourage them in your own woodland. So first thing you want to do is really look at protecting their nesting sites, planting lots of trees, um, ensuring that you're not putting heavy machinery in the forests, being aware of their breeding cycles and encouraging the chicks. Um, what you can do is if you are in an area where there's less ecosystem diversity, you can put out some, uh, you can put out some feed and food and supporting healthy growth for their chicks too. The way that they've got things set up here is that this area of woodland behind me, this is where the kites nest. They have sort of supported nesting areas where they've built these small holes into the trees that the kites can nest in, in safety, out of the lay of the wind. And then what they do is they sort of feed them into the fields here. Birds like kites are mainly carrion eaters, so they'll eat uh, raw meat. Uh, they do it at the same time we do to try and encourage them to come around in the same way. And the vital sort of funding efforts here from uh, the visitors that come watch the kites and photograph the kites help them to fund these supportive projects. Now they've released uh, nesting pairs of kites into this area and they have done for many, many years now. Kites like sparse, open woodland um, and, and sort of field areas like this, or moors, they can go out onto. So if you have a woodland space, if you're planting more trees in it, plant them perhaps less densely than you normally would and that will encourage animals like kites to come in.